Okay, we're good. Okay, we're good, are we? Shall we restart the countdown? We start again. <laughs> if we, if it does fail again, we can try and do it through my hook it onto my um, thing. Very serene countdown music. Not really used for that. It says it's relaxing music, is it? It does mean, Jonathan, that we might all be asleep shortly. Yeah. <laughs> it's ringing bells at the moment as well, isn't it? Let's just check this. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Are we live? We're going. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the third of these... Um, uh, kind of theology series that we've been doing at the beginning of each term and um, this one's called Living the Future. I'm hoping we've got a group on Zoom as well. I'm hoping, even though I couldn't possibly know if you're there, um, I'm hoping you're there. If you're there, just say hi to you as well. And uh, yeah, so let's let's kick off, shall we? Um, so this is called Living the Future and why, you might ask, is there a Kingdom of God um, event called Living the Future? And I have to confess, I stole this name from uh, a guy called Douglas Erickson. He wrote a book that is, has the title Living the Future, the Kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit in the Vineyard Movement. Now, Douglas has been in the Vineyard Movement, I think, for about 30 odd years. And he's currently based in Duluth Vineyard in, in the United States. And in a recent, recent interview he's, he's, uh, about his book, he kind of... Uh, attempted to describe what is known as the vineyard DNA and in other words what makes a vineyard a vineyard um, and it, I've just put kind of a little quotation from this interview on the screen so he said we do certain things like how we pray for healing or evangelize or train disciples we do them out of our theological commitments values affect practices and, and vice versa right so if that's true, what we believe in theology affects our practices. And what we experience affects our theology as well. So if this is all true and we have decided that it's important to identify, nurture and pass on the DNA, then we as vineyard people should be aware of the practices. John Wimber, while not supremely academically trained, had an intuitive sense of this relationship between theology and praxis. Hence, he taught and discipled the church in accordance with his theological convictions. We should do the same. Uh, so this this kind of link between um, just bear with me. this link between theology and praxis is uh, which is really about using something that we have learned, which is theology, in a practical way. Is what drew me to Vineyard in the first place. Um, so yeah, I began to see that the primary that Jesus brought was the kingdom of God, which is, of course, the kingdom of the Father, isn't it? And that we are to seek the kingdom here on earth as in heaven. Uh, and indeed, we're citizens of that kingdom. Uh, and kind of when I began to get this, we're ambassadors and citizens of that kingdom. It changed everything for me. Uh, and indeed, Jesus instructed, didn't he, in Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness but why living the future you know why is it called that what does that mean um well hopefully by the end of these two sessions that will become a bit more obvious um hopefully it won't take that long uh, but for now just to note the phrase here being used is living the future it's not living in the future so uh you know as in what the life in the kingdom might look like at some future point so we live, we think, we minister in the present, yet somehow the power of the future, the presence of God's full eschatological victory has invaded the present. So we live a future reality in the present. Is there somebody out there? <laughs> Are they coming through the wrong door? <laughs> no, they're going. Um, we live a future reality in the present. Is that confusing? It, it probably is a little bit confusing. If it is, you're in good company company because there's many theologians who have tried to grapple with this and pastors who've puzzled over it uh, it's often called the mystery of the kingdom of god can you 
just tell me again what eschatological I'm about to do that actually because <laughs> I was <laughs> that's almost my very next thing and there'll be something up on here so I'll come on to that in a moment uh, but, but we could have equally called this um, course Breakthrough, which is the title of the book by Derek Morphew on the kingdom. And, you know, the breakthrough of the blessings of the future into the present. That is something that I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm going to use a lot of the material from actually in, in these two sessions. I'm also using uh, some of Ericsson and a few other bits of source material and some of my own kind of growth in this area as well. So, right, David. <laughs> Ah, uh, right. Theological jargon busting. <laughs> so I, I'm going to do my best to be light on theological words. There aren't too many, actually, but this is one of them. You've already spotted it. I've used it, hadn't defined it. Um, eschatological. It is an important word, so I will use it from time to time. Uh, let's def define what it means. It comes from the Greek eschatos, okay? So the Greek eschatos means the end, it means the end or it means the last. So really eschatology is the theology of the end or of the last days. That's what it means. Um, and it's a really important uh, topic for the uh, kingdom of God. So what are we hoping to achieve in these two sessions? Um, I think to start with this is to uh, understand what Jesus said about in one of his parables he said the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field when a man found it he hid it again and then his in his joy he went out and sold all he had and brought that field so simply i'm just hoping that to give us some tools for digging yeah you know that we we want to explore the kingdom don't we it's a treasure that is worth selling everything for and part of that is is growing in our understanding of the kingdom but perhaps more importantly, it's learning to live the kingdom or to live the future, as we will talk about in this series. Because it's through both understanding, that's the theology, and practice that we grow. And, um, you know, this week, um, the focus of the... Uh, sorry, I've slightly got my nose, nose confused here. But, yeah, the focus on the kingdom of God is, is a focus on the, if you like, the, the, the understanding of it and, and the practice of it. So we're going to look this week at the, the recent history in the church over the last centuries about the kingdom of God. And we'll look at the Old Testament, some pictures and promises from the Old Testament. And the idea next week is that we'll look at the kingdom, the gospels and in Acts of the Apostles and reflect a little bit more about what it means to us and also some of the kind of some of the different positions that churches have been taking on this in, in recent times. So we are going to just have a little pause now, and I'm just going to maybe just suggest you gather in little little kind of groupings and have a little conversation amongst yourself um, of, you know, maybe uh, fours or fives. And uh, just to sort of consider these, these three questions, really. So the first of those is when you hear the word kingdom, what comes to mind? So see if you can come up with a definition of kingdom. Uh, and I'm talking here about a common understanding of the word kingdom. I'm not talking about the theological position yet. Just what does the word kingdom bring into our minds? Then read Acts 1.6 uh, and see what hints you get of the disciples and their understanding of the kingdom at the time that Jesus has ascended to heaven. And then thirdly, does the disciples' idea of the kingdom, which you think they might have had, fit well with your definition? So we'll give you about 10 minutes just to pull it. There's going to be two occasions when we're pulling into groups, and then we'll have some prayer time at the end. And so this is the first of those. And I think it's just self-select your groups and turn around and see who's around you and start those conversations. There's space on sofas at the back and move the chairs around. And I'm hoping on Zoom now you're, you're, you're able to do this and we'll... Hello, hello, hello. 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 Hello, you can be a mic angle. <laughs> 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 
Like I'm now thinking of like movies. In this weather, people still hold freedom of concept as well as a geographic Like they'll go to work in pharmacy. Or like there's a little bit of the eagle is the Roman symbol of this. Who's in it? Brilliant film. Um, and particularly this play, and it's been captured by King of England. So the whole film is about the journey to my country, the eagle. So I think there is room. But I've just been reading Joshua with the more promise Joshua to his land on the front. And then God it says, I divided this because um, God's details, but he, he's promised to, to are those individual kingdoms or is the whole thing kingdom? It doesn't very I, I know I know he's an secular. Um, could you run, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings, yeah. There's a kingdom, right? There's a whole kingdom, right? There's another kingdom, right? And there's other kingdoms, So, so, those are two different kingdoms. So, the kingdom is the same. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 why it was being Joshua. He has, he did, God divided it, and that is that the whole of the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm not reading it. That's the whole of the kingdom. But is it individual kingdoms? Because if you read back, the thing that he killed all the people, the king of 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 the king of
they're all coming on through the Zoom rather than YouTube. because we're looking through we look through the old testament understanding the lens if you change the lens God can be in that correct sense and so if you only have the lens So what are the things? So it's way too deep. We're about ready to go again. Well, uh, when I, when I first, um, when I was first asked that kind of question about kind of in a group really about the you know what does a kingdom bring into mind I, you probably came up with totally different things but one of the big things was about kind of like a, a castle with a moat and armies and defensive posture and things but um but of course it's not a very good picture of god's kingdom is it really <laughs> but um yeah i mean there is actually nothing new in the church about kingdom of god 
theology um, and indeed before the church, of course, because the biblical people uh, of Israel, they grew up with um, an understanding of their place as the chosen people. And, and they had an expectation that God's kingdom would be realized through them. But they lost their way a bit. And by the time of Jesus, they clearly had a very different idea about the kingdom of God. Uh, and it was different to what Jesus was proclaiming. But nonetheless, they did have a kingdom theology and they did have a kingdom expectation. Uh, and then in that bit of Acts 1-6 one, the Acts one six that was in the discussion item where it says they, they gathered around him and asked, Lord, at this time, are you going to come to restore the kingdom to Israel? It seems that they really hadn't, even after three years with Jesus, yet grasped themselves the true nature of this kingdom that Jesus was announcing. And that revelation, I think, would come to them post-Pentecost. Uh, and they began to discover then that even the Gentiles were part of the kingdom. Uh, that's us, isn't it, I think? Um, so, and then we see in the New Testament epistles, don't we, um, a kind of a really, uh, you know, kingdom-focused picture of the kingdom, because it is the word of God after all. Um, and the errors that had crept into the Jewish understanding of the kingdom were being corrected. So a few examples from Paul. Uh, in Romans, he said, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So in other words, the kingdom isn't through the written law, uh, but it's peace, righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Uh, he also said the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And he was addressing their boastful arrogance in the Corinthian church um, about kind of, you know, them being the kind of the people, you know, but it's not a matter of talk. It's actually a matter of power. Uh, he said also to, to the Corinthian church, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. You know, this is clearly not a political kingdom that is being presented here. Um, and then it, to the Colossians, he says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And here we get a picture of it being about a spiritual conflict between light and darkness, good and evil. Uh, so the kingdom in church history. So in, in the centuries after the New Testament was written, the church grew more powerful. It grew more part of the establishment in certain parts of the world. And it seemed to move further and further away from Jesus's teaching on the kingdom. And I know this is a gross oversim oversimplification. Um, and if Cheryl's part of the Zoom group, she'll tell me off because I'll probably be getting my history wrong. Um, <laughs> but um, think of some of the terrible ways in which the church has tried to establish the kingdom. Uh, you know, crusades, Spanish Inquisition, this awful mix of religion and power. Uh, and it really was a dark period, wasn't it, in the history of the church. However, by the 19th century, the theme of the kingdom of God was coming to the forefront front in a lot of Protestant thinking. And it, this was linked to what are known as the quests for the historical Jesus. Uh, and, th and there have been these three quests. So the first of these quests started in the 18th century. And the aim here was to uncover the true Jesus from the so-called mythological Jesus. The second quest started in the 1950s, and here the particular focus was on historical, the historical aspects of the Gospels, which others had chosen to reject. And in the third quest, there's no clear, obvious start for this particular quest, but there's theologians like E.P. Saunders, also N.T. Wright uh, today, uh, and they're looking for new insight, insights into the Jesus of Palestine and the Jewish context within which Jesus um, lived. And from a kingdom perspective, the key questions in each quest focused on two things, on the nature of the kingdom of God and on the timing of the kingdom of God. And the particular focus here was around what is called the parousia. I've probably pronounced that totally wrong, but a bit more theological jargon busting. Uh, the parousia literally means uh, from the Greek, the being alongside or the being present. But the context that's used, particularly in the New Testament, is, is about the coming of the king or the coming of the kingdom. And it's often used for the second coming, for example, of Jesus. Um, so, um, and, and 
and, and what they were grappling with <laughs> in these quests, particularly in the early quests, was how uh, it seemed to suggest that the the coming was imminent, the second coming and the coming of the king, as we saw in the disciples, you know, are you going to restore the kingdom now? The kingdom is coming imminently. And that was a challenge because they were living in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries and well, it hadn't come, had it? <laughs> Apparently. So, um, so this caused these quests. Um, in the first quest, uh, this um, in, this is kind of not just the first quest, this slide, but in the first quest, the nature of the kingdom was considered to be primarily ethical. Uh, so it was basically a this-worldly expression of the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. And because of this, the kingdom was seen as already being present because the kingdom was present in ethics. So if you lived according to the ethics of God, you were living the kingdom. So is that like being nice to people? Being nice to people, yeah. And kind of following, the, you know, the, think of the, the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings in there. Uh, it was kind of following those kinds of, those kinds of, you know, rule, well, not rules, but kind of Trying to be the, way nice you, the way you live, your behaviours. And that was the kingdom. And, and this, the context for this was the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, where, um, you know, it's all about science, isn't it, and what science can prove. So the, the theologians at this time stripped Jesus of the supernatural, and they saw the stories of the miracles as being part of the disciples' imaginations. And Jesus tended to be portrayed as an educated, uh, sophisticated, liberal gentleman of the Enlightenment. That's how they presented it. You see it in probably in some of the paintings and things in that kind of way. Uh, to Western intellectuals who had seen the triumphs of the French and the American revolutions that sought to free individuals from the tyranny of kings and monarchies, Jesus' ethical teaching uh, provided them with the religious justification for the rights of man, liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness. And the, so the scholars particularly emphasize the American Revolution uh, as an example of what the kingdom of God might look like, uh, namely liberty and how it was to be accomplished through the effort and work of men. But um, around the turn of the 20th century, this ethical conception of the kingdom uh, in terms of its nature and its timing uh, was being challenged. Uh, and there were theologians who emphasised the eschatological, I've got that in there again, the eschatological, in other words, the not yet bit of the kingdom. The, uh, as, and they emphasised that aspect of the character of the message. And, and they, they said that the kingdom was going to come in a final cataclysmic event at the end of history. Uh, and but the trouble is these, these theologians did struggle with this really uncomfortable truth because in their eyes, the character of Jesus was less the triumphant eschatological son of man, and more in their eyes, a flawed and pitiful hero. Uh, so they had to conclude that despite pronouncements of the coming end that Jesus had made, he was mistaken uh, about his role and about the plan of history because the expected end did not come, did it, in, in his lifetime? And even worse, he lost his own life waiting for it. Mm -hmm. So after this, there followed an, an overreaction in the other direction again. And uh, this um, here, the concern was with, um, with Jesus proclaiming that the kingdom came in his person. In other words, it was the already of the kingdom. It's here in Jesus. And Charles Harold Dodd was a, a theologian in, in this ilk. And he took the position of what is called realized eschatology. In other words, uh, the kingdom is realized in Jesus. Uh, and and it, and the this position holds that the, the kind of end time passages of the New Testament don't actually refer to the future at all, but they instead refer to the ministry of Jesus and his lasting legacy lived out through his disciples. So the eschatology is therefore not the end of the world, but it's the rebirth of the world that's instituted by Jesus and continued by his disciples. So, uh, yeah, people holding that view dismiss all the end time stuff as irrelevant. And it's all about really what the what we do now and what Jesus did then. And the final synthesis I'll just come on to before we move into the Old Testament is uh, the bringing together of these two things, the eschatological, the end, the kingdom is not yet, with the imminent, the kingdom is now, the kingdom is already here. 
And two particular uh, people to note here, Oscar Coleman and George Eldon Ladd. Um, Oscar Coleman, um, you know, sort of, he, he kind of uh, took an understanding of um, a, a battle. Think of a battle, a war. And uh, he, he likened the situation to the, this conflict where there's a decisive battle uh, that happened earlier in the war, which effectively ensured the final victory. So you might think of D-Day as that kind of battle. D-Day, you could say the war was effectively won, but it wasn't until VE Day, was it, a year later, that actually the kind of all the fighting ceased. And so he gave this picture of reconciling the now and the not yet in that way, the not yet being VE Day and the now being D-Day. Um, and uh, and that's, that. I think uh, that's used in the Alpha course, that illustration, if you've done the Alpha course. George Eldon Ladd, um, writing in the 1960s, he believed that the kingdom, um, which will appear as an apocalyptic act at the end of the age, has already come into human history in the person and the mission of Jesus um, to overcome evil and to deliver men from its power and to bring them into the blessings of God's reign. So, so that's kind of the nature and the timing. He says there's these two great moments. The first great moment is um, the fulfillment within history of the kingdom in the person of Jesus. And the second is the consummation of the kingdom at the end of history when Jesus returns. So for Lab, the significant questions of the nature and timing of the kingdom are summed up in this statement. I don't know if I've got it on the slide. Let's just see. Here we go. Yes. The kingdom is the dynamic, redemptive rule of God, active in history. That's the nature of the kingdom. The dynamic rule of God, active in history, which has two great moments. That's the timing. It was inaugurated in the mission of Jesus, and it will be finally brought to completion at the end of time. So we call Lad's theology inaugurated eschatology because it was an, the end was inaugurated in Jesus. He brought the end in his person. So there's no question here of the parousia being delayed because, because actually Jesus brought the kingdom with him. Now, both Coleman and Ladd brought a very valuable perspective of the kingdom of God. Um, and that was that, it that you can't talk about the kingdom without talking about confrontation. Uh, there's a confrontation between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Um, so we could summarize uh, from that the kingdom in this way. You know, God's rule is eternal and universal in the sense that he was, he is, and he always will be the supreme ruler of all things. He rules the heavens, the angels, the planets, nature, history. He rules all reality. Yet we do not necessarily experience his rule in our lives. The coming of the kingdom involves God's intervention in the course of human history. His power breaks through into the affairs of men, confronting the forces that withstand him and imprison people and interrupting the normal course of society. So John Wimber and, and hence Vineyard really uh, took a lot from Kuhlman and particularly from George Eldon Ladd. <laughs> and this theology did challenge various elements of previous kingdom theology, theology, not just from theological, but also from practical concerns because it was about living it. Because if you think the kingdom has come now as well as not yet, it affects how you live, how you, what, how you act and, and think as a Christian. So we'll just take stock bringing it all together, uh, defining the kingdom of God um, in terms of its nature and timing. Kingdom comes from the words king and domain, king, the king's domain. The domain is the rule and reign of the king. Um, so what is the king like, we ask first? Well, the king we know is good. He's love, he's holy, he's merciful, he's full of grace, he's full of joy. That's the king. But what is, so what's his domain like? Well, his domain is like him, isn't it? If he's good and loving and holy and mighty and just and merciful and full of grace, he rules and reigns according to who he is. You know, wherever his rule is fully welcomed, whether that be in the human heart or in a place, 
There is his kingdom. The trouble is we don't fully experience his kingdom, do we? I mean, you know, we know we don't because of the troubles that we we experience. So since the um, since the fall in the, in the Garden of Eden, the kingdom over the world has been that of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of God. Jesus himself called Satan the ruler of this world. We therefore live in the current age of that kingdom. However, um, you know, where is the kingdom um, expressed perfectly now? Where is the rule and reign? Well, it's in heaven, isn't it? So we pray, as Jesus said, your kingdom here on earth as in heaven. Why do we pray that? Because the kingdom of God is good news. Um, you know, it confronts any power that is from another kingdom. And because the future, the age to come, um, can break into the present, Jesus asks us to pray for that. Heaven come to earth. And he is a God who loves us and intervenes with us, intervenes for us. So this age to come, this future kingdom, um, can break through into the present. It will fully break through when Jesus returns. Um, but it can break through. It can become the now and not just the not yet. In Jesus, the kingdom did come to earth. It came in his person. He inaugurated the age to come. So we, we don't just have this age that we're living in, the, in the kingdom of darkness, but we also have the age to come already inaugurated. So the two ages overlap. And the demons recognize this, okay? So do you remember when Jesus went to the Gadarenes, I think it's called, in Matthew 8? And, um, you know, when, when Jesus approached them, uh, they said to him, have you come here to torment, torment us before the time? Because the future had broken through into the present because Jesus brought the kingdom with him. And there's no place for demons in the kingdom of God. And if we, you know, if we kind of get this, it will affect how we act and behave as Christians, because we are the people of that kingdom. God's spirit living in us to release the blessings of the kingdom. In, in one sense, we can understand that when the kingdom breaks through, it is the future breaking into the <coughs> present. And we can live the future. It's our inheritance. We know that God is fully victorious in the final account, don't we? But we get to see his victory breaking through. In the present, we see sicknesses healed. We see people delivered. We see hope and justice restored. We'd love to see it more, but we still see it and we press on for it. Um, so I've been through an awful lot in that short time. And I'm going to move on now from that kind of introduction around the kingdom and some of the church's position into uh, the, the, the the Old uh, and Testament and then next week into the New Testament. Um and the, we can sort of think about the Old Testament teaching and the New Testament teaching in terms of the kingdom in, in, in these kinds of ways. So uh, the Old Testament teaching on the kingdom can be summarized as, you know, the Lord is king and the Lord will become king. So you've got present and you've got future. It goes a bit deeper in the New Testament. So we get the kingdom of God will come. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is coming imminently and the kingdom of God will be delayed. And these two statements that summarize the Old Testament teaching relate to two um, big sections in the Old Testament. Um, so the first is where we get some pictures of the kingdom. Uh, the Lord as king is reflected in the pre-prophetic writings, uh, the Pentateuch, the historical books, wisdom literature, like the Psalms. And they give us these pictures of the kingdom. And the second, the Lord will become king, uh, is reflected in the prophetic writings, particularly Isaiah and Daniel, but not just them. And they're looking forward to the messianic coming of the kingdom in the future, after the loss of the kingdom uh, during the exile. Uh, and they reveal promises of the kingdom. So um, pictures of the kingdom first. Um, Derek Morphew identified the three particular events. Uh, that's not on that slide, but I'll come on to that in a moment. Three particular events that he wanted to highlight anyway from his studies. 
that serve as pictures of the kingdom coming. Uh, the Exodus story, the, the conquest of Canaan, and the reigns of Kings David and Solomon. Each of these events led Israel to confess our God reigns, proclaiming him as king, their king who is there. Israel came to understand that his rule and reign extends over nature, it extends over foreign nations, it extends over the course of history, the heavenly beings, the sea, uh, indeed, um, over everything. And uh, they also learned that God's rule was not a guarantee of blessing. Uh, and he intervenes to, according to his sovereign will. So when Israel misused and misconstrued God's reign, he intervened in a new and painful way, raising up uh, foreign nations to judge Israel, and they were brought into bondage again. So going to the Exodus first, um, the first explicit, explicit mention of God as reigning king is found in, in the Exodus story. And we see the kingdom presented in, in stages, really. The story unfolds in these stages. So the base point of the story is the revelation of the divine name, which comes, starts at the burning bush. And it constitutes the announcing, announcing of the coming reign of God. You know, we could call this the kingdom announcement. Uh, let me move on. Inherent in this name of God is his nature to come down and to intervene in the affairs of men. So we get the kingdom intervention. And this takes place at two levels. There's a spiritual intervention and battle, and there's a military or visible battle. And the result of this two-dimensional battle is the liberation of God's people. Uh, so we get Moses and Miriam's kingdom <laughs> songs of liberation in Exodus chapter 15. And this concludes in Exodus 15, 18, with the confession of the kingdom. So looking at the kingdom announcement first, uh, the revelation of the divine name. Now, the naming of a person in Hebrew, uh, uh, thinking, involved more than a mere act of picking a name, like we might do today, going through a book. Oh, I like that one. Um, it encapsulated the character and nature of a person. So for Moses to ask, what is your name? Uh, to God is to ask, what is your nature? What is your character? And God's answer was very curious, wasn't it? I am who I am. And the Hebrew name for God in that text is just these um, letters, Y-H-W-H. -H. Uh, it was considered to be such a holy name that in subsequent centuries, uh, you know, few, few dead pronounce it to the extent that it lost the vowel signs. Um, but, you know, older translations will use Jehovah, of the Bible. Uh, more recent ones will use Yahweh. Uh, it derives from the verb to be, which carries a unique ability to refer to being in the past, being in the present and being in the future. Um, and it, so it can be translated like this. I was who I was. I am who I am and I will be who I will be. And the verb is used in the Old Testament to describe uh, the, that the word of the Lord is coming to a certain prophet. So it's often used in that context. For example, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, and, it, and in each case, and actually, if you see in your Bibles, Lord written in capitals in the Old Testament, that's really Yahweh. When it's Lord is written in smaller case, it, uh, I think it's Adonai, um, but it's Yahweh when it's in capitals. And uh, it carries the idea of Yahweh becoming present. So when the word came to prophets, it meant that their words, their words became deeds. They unleashed events. You could say the word carried the idea of God being dynamically present, uh, entering the situation, invading history. So he is the God who comes to his people as he did in hearing the cries of Israel when they were in slavery. So bringing these thoughts together, we could say this. Um, this is the definition of I am. I was, I am, and I will be from generation to generation, the becoming present one, coming down into the situation of man to deliver, transform, and transform from bondage to liberty. 
So that's that's kind of a way maybe to think about the word Yahweh when you see it, or the word Lord in capitals. We go on to the kingdom intervention, um, the um, the spiritual battle next. So the message of Exodus is of two kin kingdoms in collision. Uh, to say kingdom of God, therefore, is to say something about power, about battle, conquest and victory. Uh, the way of scripture is to show the invisible before the visible. So once the invisible battle has been won, it translates into a visible battle, which I think is something that intercessors might particularly understand as, as, as part of their ministry. And behind, so you've got the political and the military might of Egypt. So behind that are spiritual powers of darkness. So uh, an example would be in Exodus chapter 7, where you get the stories of snakes. So do you remember Aaron throws his staff down, it turns to a snake. And then the magicians of Pharaoh do exactly the same thing. But then Aero's snake gobbles up their snakes. Um, you know, the snakes and the and magicians symbolize their occult powers. But the message is um, the symbolic message of their snakes being swallowed up by Aaron's, uh, Aaron's staff. It has a missable symbolic meaning that God's kingdom is mightier. And each Egyptian god had a physical representation or a symbol. So, I mean, some of the plagues, they're, they're an example. Um, you know, the, the, the scripture says that, you know, through the plagues, the gods of Egypt were defeated. So the Nile, for example, was believed to be the sacred abode of the Nile god Hapai. And in the first plague, the Nile god died. Hapai turned to blood. In the second plague, frogs, uh, they're the symbol of Hequit. Um, that's the goddess of fertility. Well, instead of making the crops and the livestock fertile, the frogs just multiply them, just in an inner fertility, and they exploded. The fifth plague, the livestock began to dry, uh, die. Sorry, <laughs> The bull was sacred to the god Apis, cows to Isis, rams to Amon, but they, they died. The ninth plague, um, one of the highest deities in Egypt was Ra, the sun god. Ra was blotted out. And the 10th plague, the tragic plague, isn't it really? Pharaoh and his firstborn were held in Egypt to be of divine conception. So the death of the firstborn represented the death of a deity. But this was God over all of the gods of darkness. There was no contest. Uh, Pharaoh couldn't contest that a superior power lay behind the events. The God of Israel was revealing himself as the sovereign Lord of nature above all the gods of Egypt. And there's the kingdom intervention in terms of the military battle that follows. And having defeated, you know, the, once the spiritual battle, we know what happened. You know, the army is kind of all flooded in on the on, on the on the um, Jordan, not the Jordan, ah, Red Sea, isn't it Red Sea? Yes, yeah, crossing of the Red Sea. Got it right. I'm getting confused now with Joshua. <laughs> but yes, you know, the military battle was won, and then the kingdom song of liberation, um, and this song we see the repeated use of the divine name. So, uh, uh, as I said, the NIV uses Lord capitalized. Um, and, you know, they continually use Yahweh or Lord capitalized in their song. And it celebrates the warrior God who wages war against Pharaoh and defeats him. Uh, and for the first time now, the, the population of slaves are free people. And then finally, the kingdom confession this is the climax of the song. It says, the Lord reigns forever and ever. The Hebrew for king is Melak, and that comes from Malak, and it means to be king, to reign. So as with the divine name, we have the concept here of a dynamic one who's, who's um, who, in terms of his dominion, rule and power, breaking through into the affairs of men. So the kingdom of God refers only in a secondary sense to a realm or an area over which the king reigns. The reign of God is primarily the event. It's the intervention, the breakthrough um, of his rule. And summarizing the Exodus picture, the king is for his people. He hears their cry. And he intervenes. He is against the oppressor of the people. 
he declares holy war on the gods and powers of Egypt. The king is a mighty warrior bringing deliverance through battle. He comes because he loves his people. His means freedom for his people. As they realize they're finally free, the people celebrate the God of Israel is king and redeemer. His kingdom brings liberation. And with that, we'll break into another discussion slot. And I just this this is really just an opportunity to discuss how how we feel the picture of the kingdom uh, from the Exodus points forward to the fulfillment of the kingdom in Jesus Christ. And also, are there any aspects of that Exodus picture that don't actually really fit quite so comfortably with our understanding of the fulfillment of the kingdom in Jesus Christ? Does that make sense? So how do, what do we see about Jesus's ministry from the story of the Exodus that I've just presented? Yeah, 10 minutes on that, you could just do the same thing. What I might do is just put it back there mm. because that might help <laughs> with that summary slide. But just think about the Exodus and what that might reveal to us as a picture about what comes when Jesus comes. All right, sorry, yeah. <coughs> Coffee, actually. <laughs> But I guess it's really I mean, I'm the literal. 
Yeah, so I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. physical to, to, to the, the spiritual, uh, the kingdom. Which, 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 because <laughs> 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 Yeah, but what does it do? Like, yeah. 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 So it is the future of baby now in terms of the kings of God has been in and the uh, kingdom of darkness is currently and so it is but therefore you can say that you can say that the kingdom of the kingdom of God ruling as type of that's how it's quite fully in. That's that's in the game. Yeah, in the short Then, since the world and tide washes out, and then Jesus is the slack water. It's like water at low tide when tide ends up. She was up there. Get the 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 I think that stops a second fall. Yeah, I mean, the second 
Yeah. 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 Should we just make a start up again? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, in a similar way to um, how Paul calls Jesus the second Adam, living in as a perfect, sinless human in a way that Adam could not do. Many have seen Jesus as a second Moses, uh, bringing in a new Exodus. And uh, so in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, this is Moses saying it, from among you, uh, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, we call typology uh, in theology. So Moses is really like, like a type for Jesus, sort of an example of what Jesus will be like, or the perfection of the type mm. um this was the was clearly the perfect uh complete and deliverer beyond what moses was but nonetheless moses is a type for jesus and just as moses is dubbed as the teacher of israel matthew's gospel presents jesus teaching in a parallels with moses as i say he is the teacher of israel uh, and we see that particularly in things like the Sermon on the Mount, the amazing teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and this new Moses is going to bring in a new exodus. And this was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 43. I, I don't know if that's on the scripture. What is that here? I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord who makes, notice the Lord, by the way, in capitals, Yahweh, who makes a way in the sea a path in the mighty waters who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not one Peter. Our life group recently looked at one Peter. We did a series on that. And this kind of theme of kind of new exodus comes up again and again. You know, we've got the, the Passover lamb, haven't we? Jesus is the Passover lamb rescued from death to life. We are rescued from slavery to freedom. Um, but I think there is one aspect of the Exodus story perhaps we do need to understand in a slightly different way um, in, in terms of Jesus' fulfilment because the kingdom um, as fulfilled in Jesus was never really about a physical battle in the way we understand that, was it really? Um, and I guess much to the disappointment of the Jewish authorities who wanted the Romans overthrown. Um, so Paul said in Ephesians 6, we, we looked we looked at this at our prayer meeting on, on Tuesday, which is why I thought of it for tonight. Paul said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not manifested, is it, through a military battle, perhaps in the same way as in, in the Exodus story. But the spiritual battle still does have a visible expression. You know, when people are set free from bondage, there is something that happens that affects the physical as well as the spiritual battle that has happened. And, and remember how Jesus responded to John's disciples when he, John was in prison and they asked, John was wondering, you know, I'm in prison. The Romans are still in power. Are you the really the one who was to come? 
And Jesus says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf ear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. That is the sign of the kingdom coming in Jesus. That shows that he is indeed the one to come. The second picture, I think I might skip over this just for time, just give us a bit more time at the end for prayer, but just very briefly, it really is. Uh, I think I mentioned this is about the entering of the promised land and the conquest of Canaan. And, and in this picture, that um, Israel came to know uh, that. Uh, so it, in, in the Exodus, they came to know God as king over Egypt and over nature, the way he kind of influenced nature and conquered Egypt. But here they get to know him as the king over all the nations because all the nations are conquered as as he as he, as he enters. And we do see if we go into it the similar pattern of spiritual battle and physical, you know, military battle that, that, that and then the sort of the, the celebration. And I'll jump through that one and I'll go on to um, the Davidic, Davidic monarchy. So um, you know we can see I think the David. David I guess I'll say that. You can say it, David, can't you? <laughs> Davidic. Davidic, there we go. <laughs> Davidic monarchy as the fulfillment of the prophecies made to Moses of the good life in the promised land. Okay, so we can understand it in those terms. Um, Derek Morphew and his, his um, teaching on this, he identifies three key texts, texts on it. Firstly, Psalm 2, which is a David psalm. Um, and second, I think there was um, 2 Samuel 7 and 8 and 1 Kings 4. So just looking at two, Psalm 2 first, which is quite an interesting one. So the time of confrontation, uh, this, this time of confrontation that is, is happening isn't between two kingdoms. It's instead all of the kingdoms of the world that are going to rise up against God. So David says, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up. And rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. Uh, But then we see God's power is overwhelming. So David goes on. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So in the David, in the Davidic monarchy, uh, God would no longer speak through a prophet like Moses. He would rule from heaven through a representative king that he had established on earth. And so we get this term Messiah, which means anointed one. Uh, and, and um, you know, and there would be an anointed one uh, for their king. And David was the first anointed one. Just as Moses was a type for Jesus as prophet and teacher, David was a type for Jesus as king and ruler. And so David in the psalm goes on in verse 7. He says, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. In the uh, Exodus kingdom picture that we've just looked at, we saw the progression of the coming of the kingdom in sequence from the kingdom announcement That was about the divine name, the kingdom intervention through spiritual and then military battle, and then the kingdom song of liberation. And we do get an equivalent in the Davidic monarchy. Um, So um, not quite exactly the same, but 2 Samuel 7, we we, we deals with the promise of the kingdom through the prophet Nathan. 2 Samuel 8 describes the victories over the surrounding nations. And then in 1 Kings, Kings 4, we see the manifestation of the kingdom blessing and the celebration of the kingdom. So taking 2 Samuel 7 first, the prophetic promise of the kingdom in 2 Samuel 7 has various key elements. So David wants to build a physical house, uh, a temple that the Lord is going to live in. Uh, But God says, I'm going to build a spiritual house and a dynasty for David. God is going to give David a great name. So David is is kind of declaring God's great name. And God is saying, I'm going to give you a great name. Uh, And the essence of house and name is the establishing of the kingdom. 
the house and the name. So in 2 Samuel 7, 16, it says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And the basis for kingship, as with Psalm 2, is adoptive sonship. So he says the same formula, God, he's, uh, it, it, through Nathan. He says, I will be his father. He will be my son. And David's response in 2 Samuel 7, verses 18 to 29, is just powerful worship and praise, reminiscent of that kingdom song of liberation in Exodus chapter 15. Then in 2 Samuel 8, um, the, the spiritual basis of the kingdom was revealed in the prophetic promises. But then chapter 8 takes us through the visible military expression of the kingdom. And there's this recurring refrain in this chapter. The Lord Yahweh gave David victory wherever he went. And then the climax in this is found in verse 15, where it says, David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people, functioning pretty much in the same way as the Exodus 15, 18 um, kingdom declaration we saw in the Exodus story. And then moving on to 1 Kings 4, um, this describes the kingdom of Solomon at its zenith. And it gives a picture of what God's kingdom is like manifested in that time. So there's kingdom celebration and multiplication. You know, God promised Abraham that Israel would be like the sand of the seashore. And under Solomon, this began to happen. This was a growing nation who were tasting the Messianic banquet, prospering because Solomon's reign reflected God's rule. Well, it did at the beginning anyway. Um, kingdom prosperity. Uh, an oriental monarch was judged by the magnificence of his court. Well, Solomon's court was would have exceeded the full United Nations in session. Such was the banquet that was kind of laid out there. And the Queen of Sheba was overwhelmed by Solomon's wisdom and his prosperity. Kingdom peace. So the word shalom, I'm sure you're all familiar with that word. Uh, this is more than the absence of war. It's total well-being in every aspect of your life. So every Israelite lived under their own vine and fig tree. They experienced shalom because of the sheer power of Solomon's rule expressed in his military machine and his efficient economy. Then kingdom lifestyle. You know, Israel uh, never distinguished between material and spiritual the glory of the kingdom included far more than material prosperity. So God gave Solomon wisdom and great insights. Um, he saw things from the perspective of the kingdom. Solomon spoke, it says, 3,000 proverbs, uh, which are practical guidance for everyday life. He wrote 1,005 songs. The Song of Solomon itself is an uninhibited piece of romantic literature. Um, and both the romantic and the spiritual are an expression here of the kingdom. You know, when the kingdom comes, your relationships are transformed, not just the spiritual ones. Um, he was also a biologist, a zoologist, an ornithologist, herpetologist. You can tell me what herpetologist is. Herpetologist. Herpetologist. Spanish, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? That's for Latin. <laughs> it's reptiles. And a, what about this one? An ichthyologist. Fish. Fish. Well done. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> well, he was all those things. Verse 33, you'll see that. I mean, the rule of God applies to every possible area of our endeavor. The Davidic monarchy ushered in a period of great worship to the, the Psalms, weren't there? And the magnificent temple. And the better we understand the extent of God's reign, the more glorious we perceive his throne to be. His rule is eternal and universal. It extends over all nations and all of nature. Psalm 145, 13 is an example there. So just drawing all this together. Have I got a slide on that? No, I haven't. Right. Um, God's intervention always brings liberty. The kingdom brings the rule of justice. Knowing God means living under his wise and his righteous administration. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives uh, food to the hungry. He sets prisoners free. He watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless <coughs> and the widow. 
his rule encompasses all of our life, family life, community life, international re relations, poetry, philosophy, culture, and so forth. Um, and I'm going to move on now, I think. I just want to say a little bit about covenant, but I'll just skip that and I'll move on to the promises of the kingdom. Um, and so that was the pictures of the kingdom, just a few sort of illustrations. In terms of the promise of the kingdom, the second part of the two bits of the Old Testament that I mentioned, here, the, so the, in the pictures, the focus was the Lord is king, present. Here, the focus is the Lord will become king. How did we get from the present tense to the future tense? Well, we do know, don't we, that subsequent kings, starting with the fall of Solomon himself, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The kings no longer represented the king well. Prophet after prophet warned Israel of certain doom, but they didn't listen. Mm -hmm. And eventually the judgment of God was going to fall. So we had the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and they became the new Egypt. The kingdom was lost. And we had the dark night of the soul expressed in Psalm 137. You can sing it if you want by the rivers of Babylon, <laughs> where we sat and wept, where we remembered Zion. Um, you know, the prophets saw that the future breakthrough that was going to come would be far greater than the previous interventions of the kingdom. This time, the kingdom would involve more than the Middle East. It would cover the whole earth and reach cosmic proportions, eventually including a new and renewed heavens and earth. So and as Isaiah and Daniel are perhaps the two Old Testament prophets, prophets that deal with this most, and Jesus drew very frequently from them when talking about himself. Um, Boach counts their prophetic word in the context of deliverance from the Babylonian exile. To some extent, their predictions were fulfilled were fulfilled with the return from that exile and the restor restoration of the land at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. But their promises ranged far beyond that historical period, and they reached indeed the ultimate horizon of world history. You know, they prophets, these prophets realized that the future is going to eclipse the past. And because they were seers, uh, that's what they were called, seers, they were not strictly logical or systematic in their thinking so we have dreams and revelations but they don't really operate on a systematic level so they didn't really lay down neat time scale or define what whether the events god was showing them were near or whether or they were distant and as a result they were able to hold together this tension of the immediate and the distant future and to describe events filled in the return from exile in the same context of events that would only be filled, fulfilled at the second coming or indeed were fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. So Isaiah, um, taking him first. I'm um, oh, sorry, I've jumped too far ahead, haven't I? Promises of the kingdom, Isaiah. A uh, major theme uh, is the coming of the kingdom um, or of the messianic era. And his starting point is God, the king, will come and the spirit will be poured out, bringing salvation. In, as I, in Isaiah's terms, salvation includes the whole spectrum of God's mercy and peace in creating a new people of God and creating a new order. So God will come, taking that first. So we have that wonderful uh, scripture. I mean, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. You know, the idea of gospel or good news comes from Isaiah. God will come and save and comfort his people. Uh, secondly, the coming king, again from Isaiah, for, us, for, and for, us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne, the coming king, isn't he? Over his, and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Then the coming spirit. 
So from Isaiah 44, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like glass, glass, grass in a meadow. <laughs> Hopefully not glass in a meadow. Uh, grass in a meadow like popular trees uh, by flowing streams. You know, one can't see this in the Old Testament without New Testament hindsight. But in describing the coming of God, the coming of the king and the coming of the spirit, Isaiah makes it clear that it is the Trinity who will finally break through into human history. God is going to come in his fullest sense to bring salvation. So then the coming salvation um, and Isaiah 49 and, and it says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tri tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. And become, and salvation is, is all embracing in Isaiah's terms. It's forgiveness of sins and healing. It's, it, it brings freedom. It means peace for God's people age that's to come you know we think of solomon's table there uh, as a result of this salvation god's people will be a new people forming a new nation in a new city with a new temple and that brings us on to the um the new people uh, isaiah 66 and they will bring all your people from all the nations to my holy mountain in jerusalem as an offering to the lord on horses in chariots and wagons and on mules and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring, Israelites bring their grain offer, offering to the temple of the Lord in ceremon ceremonially clean vessels. And then we get the new order, Isaiah 65. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered and they will come, uh, nor will they come to mind. You know, Isaiah's vision of the kingdom is massive in <clears throat> scope. He saw the coming of the kingdom as one great event. God in his glory, the king in his justice, the spirit in abundance, salvation, forgiveness, healing, joy, resurrection. Um, the new international people of God, the new Jerusalem, the new order, the final judgment were all part of the day of the Lord. All this together is the messianic hope, the kingdom of God, as expressed in Isaiah. And just moving briefly on to Daniel as the final of the prophets, just to briefly look at. So here, here we, there's two particular visions to note, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Um, I think I'll just do Daniel 2, but they're quite, they're quite similar in scope. Um, so Daniel 2, um, here we have uh, Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Babylon. He has a dream. Um, and no one but Daniel can interpret this dream. And in this dream, he saw a large, sees a large human image that was struck by a stone that fell from heaven. And that stone grew until it covered the whole earth. The image uh, is that of a man representing various human kingdoms. Um, the successive manifestations of governments and powers in history. Uh, so traditionally, it's interpreted as follows. So... This, this man that is struck, uh, the head of gold is, is considered the Babylonian Empire, the breast and arms of silver is the Medo-Persian Medo Empire, belly and things of bronze uh, is the Greek Empire, and the legs and feet, the Roman Empire. And to be honest, I think you could add any empire that's against God, because there's been so many, haven't there? Uh, but, um, but this is kind of what traditionally has been interpreted. But the stone not cut from human hands falls from above. And that's initiated by the God of heaven. And it fills the whole earth as God's everlasting kingdom. So the four world empires represent this age, the age that we're in. Um, the coming of the kingdom represents the age to come. And this is the basic conceptual framework of the New Testament. So in the parable of the weeds, for example, we see two kinds of seeds in Matthew 13. Jesus And Jesus speaks of the end of the age and the kingdom of their father, uh, which is to come. So we get kind of these, this, and, and we see it again in Mark 10, actually, where Jesus speaks of this present age and the age to come. 
And Paul also does that in Ephesians. It's, it's throughout the New Testament. So the transition in this Daniel picture from this age to the age to come is cataclysmic. The stone pulverizes the image. The kingdom of God crushes all those kingdoms. The kingdom brought by an individual stone grows into an <clears throat> empire that covers the entire globe. And uh, I won't go into Daniel 2 now for lack of time, but it's a similar kind of picture, really. Mm. Um, and just to summarize, the uh, to bring that all together and summarize it, God, God deals with man in, in two ages. There's this age, this present age, and the age to come. And the dawning of the new age is the same thing as the coming of the kingdom. The kingdoms that exist now are of human origin, corrupt, consigned to divine judgment. The kingdom of, that is coming is the work of God. It's eternal. The change from this age to the age to come will be cataclysmic. The one who ushers in the kingdom, this was actually in Daniel 7, which we didn't get to, is the son of man. Remember that phrase from the, how Jesus describes himself. So the son of man ushers in the kingdom. And this is a heavenly divine figure who contains within in himself the future redeemed humanity that will occupy <coughs> the kingdom of God. So what is the promise of the kingdom? It's a vision that grew out of Israel, <coughs> Israel's understanding of the breakthrough of the kingdom in the Exodus the Sinai Covenant, the, the um, Davidic monarchy. The vision burst the bounds of past experience to be a future coming of God that will be final, the day of the Lord. <coughs> God will come in all his glory, the king with justice. The spirit will be poured out in abundance. The result will be salvation, healing, forgiveness, liberation, resurrection, eternal joy this will create a new people of god a new jerusalem new heaven and new earth human rebellion and sin will be judged the lord is king and he will become king and that is my amen to that um if if you're up for some homework <laughs> you might want to do this just <clears throat> Just prayerfully <laughs> reflect on what questions this evening's presentation on the kingdom of God might have raised for you about the nature and the timing of the kingdom. And if you're really keen, why not read Isaiah through and underline every bit of it where you see a passage that relates to the coming of the king, the coming of his spirit and the age of the kingdom. And you'll be surprised how much you underline Um and if you're somewhere in between, maybe read Daniel 7, the one that we didn't get to. <laughs> and if but, you're like me and you could never read through the whole of Isaiah in a year, you can get the audio Bible. And it's amazing. Can you underline it in the audio? No. But you can take <laughs> Actually, you can. If you do it on the Bible app, you can highlight it. Um, we've got to just up to nine. Um, so, um, but if I, I did think if, if, if people are happy, if people obviously if people need to get away because it is nine, no worries about that at all. But it would just be nice to have a bit of time to pray uh, in groups, I think, um, to have a, an opportunity to sort of pray into some of this stuff. I mean, my only suggestion here was from that um, Derek Morphew kind of quote on the, the, what Yahweh means, I was, I am, I will be from generation, the coming present one coming down into the situation of man to deliver, transform from bondage to liberty. And I just thought, are there any situations here this evening, where we could do with that kind of intervention of God to transform a particular situation that might be troubling us, um, um, because He is the becoming present one. He is Yahweh. He is the God who intervenes. Uh, he He heard the cry of the Israelites, and um, maybe there's a little bit of a cry in some of our hearts. Uh, and I would just would I would just love there to be an opportunity, um, you know to pray about some of those things in 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 groups if if you would like to do that but you don't have to do that at all actually you could pray about anything but uh, that was just what came to me um so can i just suggest that anyone who'd like to, to remain for to pray we just break, get into little groups and 
and I think I will join because I could do some with some of that myself. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, and I'm going to move my chair into a group. <laughs>